Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about FASTP, an ultra fast all in one FASTQ preprocessor. So you can use this for RNA seq experiments, DNA seq, or anything else that involves a FASTQ file. It combines a lot of different functionalities, as you can see quality control, adapters, quality trimming filtering, etc. as you need. It's actually very simple to use and integrate into pipelines. It contains a whole bunch of features. As you can see here, I'm not going to go through each one of these extensively, but I'm going to highlight a couple that stood out to me. Another reason why I usually integrate it into pipelines that I'm working at. The first is that it's very easy to install. It's available in Bioconda, which is how we're going to use it today. The example that I've prepared. It's easy to navigate the reports, generates both an HTML and a JSON report. It has automatic quality filter. It's a conservative quality filter, but helpful nonetheless a length filter which specifically takes out reads that are less than 15. There shouldn't really be those kinds of lengths ultimately but if there's a certain read that is has a lot more adapter it you might get to that length and ultimately require a conservative length filter. Removes low complexity reads. The definition is specifically on this page. It also has automatic adapter detection for both paired end and single end reads. Or you can specify the adapter sequence if you know it, which will speed up the program a bit. But automatic adapter detection is a really key feature, is why this is a quite useful tool whereas with other comparable prototype with other comparable programs you need to specify which adapters are associated with which experiments or simply have a list of all of the different possible adapters you think might be associated with an experiment and just try them all out via the program it also does quality score trimming which on the front and the back in order to remove reads that have a low fee red score that have a low s score from base quality call score from the sequencer itself and then you can see there's a lot of other kinds of processing splitting of files etc that it performs based on all of these different command add-ons I would highly recommend that if you're going to use FASTP that you look through the GitHub page and figure out which of these options are relevant for your application, are relevant for your type of FASTQ preprocessing. The paper claims that FASTP is typically two to five times faster than other Pre-processing tools such as Trimomatic or Cutadapt, and practical experience has certainly borne that out. Now I'd like to introduce a quick example to show how easy it is. This is a Google Collaboratory notebook that has Bioconda installed, as I can show you up here. This code is actually it works for any Google Collaboratory notebook you can use this to install Bioconda and then Bioconda is the repository that contains all of the different uh, bioinformatics tools that you can then use and implement either on your own hardware or in this case on Google's hardware on the Google Collaboratory and then I brought in the FASTQ file via SRA, the SRA toolkit, and there's a few other you know, aspects 
to this notebook, but today we're focusing specifically on the FASTP program. And here I have, this has already been run before, but I'll run it again as an example. This is FASTP. This is how simple the command line interface is. You specify your input file, and then you specify the output file. And this command here is an example of a single end fastq file, single end read. If you have paired end reads, we can go back to the GitHub page and see an example of how you would do a paired end read. And then you can specify what the file names for the HTML and JSON are with the dash H and dash J options respectively. And so as you can see, while we took a little detour onto the GitHub page, the adapter sequence for read one was detected. Ultimately it filtered or after it filtered approximately 500,000 reads out of the program from a original uh, amount of approximately 16,500,000 to 15,800,000. And so you can see the reason why each of these reads failed to pass muster, so to say, quality n bases, n bases are what the sequencer puts for a base call if it isn't sure exactly which base call or which base was actually called. Reads that had an adapter trimmed, reads that failed because they were too short, bases trimmed, all of this report. And since we didn't specify with those options what the names of these are, we just got the default fastp.json and fastp.html. And then once you've completed the program, it's generated the files, it will say how long it took to run. So in this case, it only took 57 seconds, which is, for comparison, the hard work that Google Collaboratory is providing us, we can uh, see, is typically around 12 gigabytes of RAM, according and 100 gigabytes of disk space, according to the Google Collaboratory description, according to their home page. So 57 seconds on a machine like that is pretty fast for filter for you know analyzing 16,500,000 reads from an RNA seq file, and it also tells you the version of FastP that you're using. They're constantly adding in new features and improvements and such in order to stay up to date so it's good to know the version information. Now we'll go through an example of a FASTP report. It's not for the file that we just generated but it's a similar kind of sample. It's from a single end sequencing platform that utilized reads of length 35, as it could tell. And you can see here, it provides what was the mean length before and after filtering. Typically, that doesn't change by much, one or two base pairs. The duplication rate, which is essentially estimating what percentage of the reads are not unique. And then, what does it detect for the adapters, potential adapters? And if it's detecting an adapter that is quite popular, it will also provide the name of that adapter, the TrueSeq adapter or whatnot. This was an actually very small file. There's only 2.21, 2.22 million reads. Provides what percentage of bases are greater than 20 phi red score and what are greater than 30 phi red score. Do a quick definition of that. The phi red score is provided by the sequencing machine, the sequencing platform, and provides a measure of 
base call accuracy. You can see at a score of 30, the base call accuracy is estimated to be 99.9%, .9%, whereas at 20, it's only estimated to be 99%. Typically, you want for most of your for most of your reads you want it to be and for most of your bases you want it to be above 30 sequencers if they're going to go below 20 typically do it at the beginning and the end of the read because it's a little harder to call at those spots but you want the majority of your reads the majority of the lengths across the base pairs to be above 30 This then provides the same statistics as before here, but after all of the filtering has completed. And there's also, helpfully, the reasons for why different reads were filtered or removed as per the command line output. So you don't always have to store the command line output. That's automatically, that information is automatically found within the HTML report. And so you can see here what were the different adapters that were detected and removed ultimately from reads. You can see the graph for the duplication rate certain uh, on the whole. And it provides quality reports. These are those FEVRAD quality scores that I just mentioned. And how does that change per base? And what is the mean? Well, I'll cross the whole read over the position, and you can see that for this one, it's they're all under 30, but greater than 27. So there, and it goes down over time, but not significantly. It doesn't go to a quality score of 10 or such. So that's something to keep in mind that you always need to look at the left-hand y-axis to see how is the quality changing because if you're going down to 10 or 7 if you're going down to really low qualities that's important to know rather than just thinking oh it's low on the graph so therefore it must be low there isn't a standard sort of y-axis that's typically employed although I will note that the HTML report does include plotly graph features plotly is a Python library that's typically used to can be generate interactive graphs. So there's a lot of features up here. You can zoom, you can pan, you can look at different parts, different base calls and changes individually, you know, on a bit granular level. So all of those features are included within the HTML report. And it provides sort of how does the ATGC content change over the different positions and typically you want this to stay pretty level pretty constant and then it provides Kamer counting so this is specifically looking at all of the different combinations between these strings of three bases and these strings of two bases and so when you look at all of these different combinations, all the different ways that you can combine five bases, you can see which ones, uh, which ones of those sequences across all the reads have larger counts than the other one. And typically you want this to look a little bit more uniform. So you can see when you hover over specifically what the count for that Kamer is so the Kamer T T T T T appears appears three million three hundred and four sorry appears three hundred and thirty one four hundred and twenty three thousand times and that is eight points approximately eight point seven times the mean value across all of these cameras and that's why it has a darker background so you can see right away without looking at all the numbers that that one appears a lot more frequently than a lot of these other cameras five mers
The same data is provided again, looking at how has it changed after the filtering. And typically, these don't look too dramatically different from before the filtering. The filters and such are meant to be a little bit more conservative, meant to just simply improve the overall quality of the reads, remove the few that don't match quality specifications, and then leave the rest. And on the whole, that's a good thing. If you want, basically, when you're performing an RNA sequencing experiment or whatnot, you want the majority of the reads and the majority of across the lengths of the reads to be high quality sequencing data relevant to the biological question that you're asking or whatever question you're asking with the sequencing data. So you can see as I scroll down that the data isn't changing too dramatically. Although, as you can see, the amount of end counts has decreased in a fashion that is noticeable. So on the end of the 35, you see that 0.536% of reads at this space had an end count at this base, at this uh, base position, had an end count. And when you look down here, that number has now gone down to 0.031%. So that is a very noticeable decrease. And as you might guess, an end count, if the sequencer isn't sure whether what base was just called indicates that's pretty low sequencing quality and that has been removed. So you can see from this example, you know, there are changes that are improving the quality. You can notice what those changes are, but they're not changing the overall pictures, you know, like the ACGT content, for example, by dramatic amounts. They're not changing the K-mere counting dramatically. You can see, still see that TTTTT appears Eight, now it's 8.82 times the mean value before it was 8.73. Provide specifically also the command to generate this. So as you may notice, in this example, I did include the dash H and the dash J options in order to name the HTML and JSON files for the single end read. And then again, the version and the time stamp for when the report was actually generated. Hope this introduction to FASTP was helpful. Thank you for listening.